We're walking through the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of faith. And this month, we're looking at four characters. Four characters that we would like to learn from out of the 16 names that are listed for us in Hebrews chapter 11. We want to just pull out four characters, ordinary people like you and I that are doing extraordinary things for God. This character that we're looking at is Joseph. Remember last Sunday we looked at Abel. In between Abel in chapter 4 and Joseph, who is mentioned in chapter 2, there are several other characters that are mentioned. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Jacob are mentioned in between. But let's pull out Joseph as an ordinary character that we can focus our attention on today. Joseph is listed um, in verse 22 of, of Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible says, By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. Many of us know Joseph's story. It features in literally a third of the book of Genesis, from chapter 37 to chapter 50 of the book of Genesis. But Joseph is a unique character. He's a unique character among the other 16 characters that are listed in Hebrews chapter 11 because in Joseph's case, something seems wrong with him. And the reason why there's something that seems wrong with him is this is one character in Scripture where it is difficult to find a fault with him. He has no moral failure. He has no character flaws. He has no crazy habits. He makes no poor decisions. There's no nothing to pull out from him that I can be able to relate with him because he looks like a perfect character in Scripture. There's hardly any similarity between Joseph and his father, Jacob, who was full of character flaws. He was born of his father. Many of you know uh, Jacob, who deceived his brother Esau of his birthright. He fled to Laban. He falls in love with Rachel. He has to work 14 years so that he can marry her because he married his sister, Rachel's sister Leah beforehand. Then he has two wives. They start fighting with each other. There's drama in the home, even among their, their children. There's so much drama that surrounds Jacob's life. Jacob is flawed. But Jacob gives birth to the firstborn son of his wife, Rachel, and this guy, Joseph, is like a poster child. He's like a perfect image of a boy, perfect image of a child. But today, even though we can't identify with how perfect he was, I think there's one thing that we can all identify with. Because however perfect he seems in Scripture, this man equally faced challenges and difficulties in his life, regardless how seemingly perfect he was. The story of Joseph reminds me today of a story many of us have heard before. It's a story that has done rounds on the internet, a story that has done rounds on social media. It's a story that many of us know. It's the story of the pencil. The story of the pencil. Some people call it the pencil story. And I'm going to re relate this pencil and the story that is given about the pencil with Joseph's life story and allow us to glean from them lessons from Joseph's life that God would have us begin this year with, even as ordinary people that desire to do extraordinary things for God. The story of the pencil goes that the pencil maker, when he finished making the pencil, he looked at the pencil and told the pencil, I think there are four things that you need to know about yourself so that you can become the most effective pencil ever. There are four distinct things about this pencil that are life lessons to us and that will help us be effective even as we continue on this year. And I'll go through these four and relate them to the life of Joseph. The first principle, as this pencil maker looked at the pencil, he told the pencil, never forget that number one, you always need to be sharpened so that you can be effective. As a pencil, you always need to be sharpened so that you could be effective. The first principle we learn from Joseph's life is that same principle, the principle of sharpening. 
The most effective pencil is a sharpened pencil. The most effective pencil is a pencil that allows itself to go through the difficult and trying experience of being sharpened, of being cut out, of being uh, sharpened. I know in this generation, we don't have a clue what sharpening a pencil is, eh? you know? Uh, but there are many people that understand what sharpening a pencil is because we used it. Some of us, at least now, we do it for our kids. But there's a generation that is coming up that if you told them, sharpen this pencil, they're like, huh? You know? Uh, some of us used various tools. It started from our mouth. Remember those days? I don't know if you remember those ones. You know, you used a, you know, different, but yeah, let's say sharpener. Okay? Sharpening a pencil. Let's relate this to Jacob's life. Sorry, to Joseph's life. Joseph is Jacob's most favorite son because he's the firstborn son of the woman that he loved, Rachel, and that he worked 14 years to be able to get. This son is a favorite son of his, and at the age of 17, this son had a dream. Joseph had a dream that he would one day rule over all his brothers and become a ruler of many. He even has a dream where the sun, the moon, and the stars bow down to him. How humbling, you know, and a dream of sheets of grain bowing down, several bunches of them bowing down to him. And he comes and announces it to his brothers. Not a very wise thing to do. He announces it to his brothers, and his brothers who are already jealous about him now decide that this man is getting too much, and they decide to get rid of him. Many of us know the story. They took him and they threw him into an empty well. Then later on they decided, no, let us actually sell him off to Egypt. Some of them wanted to kill him quietly. They just wanted to get rid of him. And Joseph finds himself as a pencil in a sharpener. Because when they sold him out to Egypt, he was sold out to slavery in Egypt. And he found himself in Potiphar's house. In Egypt, And this is where the process of adversity in his life begins. He has to overcome betrayal from his brothers that sold him away to Egypt. He has shattered dreams and hopes. And after serving faithfully in Potiphar's house, unfortunately, he is falsely accused of trying to rape Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar is mad with him and throws him into prison. And overnight... Joseph finds himself in the deepest and the darkest pit of his life. Very different from the well that he initially found himself in. You know, when things seem like they're moving from bad to worse, when things seem like I'm the bottom, I'm at the bottom and nothing could be worse than this. When you're at the worst place of your life, the worst place for Joseph was jail. When you're at the worst place of your life, the worst place for the pencil is the sharpener. Those blades that cut off a lot of things in it. The worst place for me may just be the best place for God. And that's what Joseph realized. Your darkest hour, your lowest moment may be God's perfect destiny spot for your life. The worst place for me may be the best place for God. The worst place that you're in right now, that place of discouragement, that place of despair may be the crucible that God needs to shape and to mold you and cut away what is not necessary so that you become effective in the place that God would like you to be. The principle of sharpening. The second principle that we learn, that we learn from Joseph's life is the principle of holding. The principle of holding. The principle of holding. So this pencil maker picks up the pencil and looks at the pencil. And he tells the pencil, the second thing you need to know about yourself is that for you to be effective as a pencil or for you to do anything as a pencil, you must be held by the right hand. You must be held by the right hand. A pencil in and of itself when it's lying down would do no difference and would be able to have no impact in this world. But when a pencil is held in the right hand, it can do amazing things. Joseph finds himself in such a place where his adversity has grown to the place where he was thrown into Egypt's most secure prison. Many times we don't realize 
that God's hand was upon Joseph even when he was thrown into the prison. If you knew who Potiphar was, Potiphar was one of the most powerful people in Egypt at that particular time. A man of such great power, a man of such great position. If a slave did anything like that in his house, what this man of great power and position would have done, he would have ordered that this man be immediately beheaded without flinching. And he would have picked this man's head, put it on a stick, and stuck the stick out of his house so that other slaves in Egypt can be able to see what happens to a slave that disrespects him. The first place we see God's hand at work in Joseph's life is Joseph was not beheaded. Instead, Potiphar chose to lock Joseph up in prison. What I suggest to us today is that Joseph was in God's hands and not in Potiphar's hands. From the start of his life journey, we see Joseph being held by the hand of God. In fact, in Genesis chapter 39, in Genesis chapter 39 from verse 2 to verse 5, in five verses, we see the phrase, the Lord was with Joseph, mentioned five times. Five times in five verses, the scripture reminds us that God was holding Joseph. That Joseph was in God's hands. And in the same chapter, chapter 39 of Genesis, we see seven times this phrase being mentioned. Seven times the Bible says, the Lord was with Joseph. God is giving us a seven-fold assurance that if God is holding our life, and if God is upholding our hands, if God is the one carrying us through a situation, then we don't need to fear because we are going to be victorious. The same thing happened to Joseph. The point that God was trying to tell Joseph is many times our difficulties, our discouragements, our challenges, and our issues, and our situations are simply sandwiched by God's presence. And when they are sandwiched, by God's presence. And that's what happened to jo uh, Joseph. Joseph was sandwiched by God's presence. God had covered him with his presence and told him, because I am surrounding you, because I am upholding you, then this situation will not crush you. This situation will not overcome you. We see Joseph going through fiery trials. We see him going through discouragements and difficult times simply because God was holding him up. And because God was with him through this entire journey, it made the world of a difference. The lesson number two is the principle of holding. Who is holding your life at this time? The third principle that Joseph teaches us is the principle of the inside. The principle of the inside. The principle of the inside. As this pencil maker looked at the pencil, he looked at the pencil and said, the third thing I want to teach you, pencil, is for you to make an impact in this world, you need to learn and to discover that it is what is inside you that is more important than what is outside of you. The most important part of a pencil is the inside. What is on the inside of the pencil is more important than what is on the outside. You see, in prison, Joseph would have sulked. Joseph would have sulked and complained because of the deep injustice that he had experienced all the way from his childhood. It had not just happened in Potiphar's house. It started among his brothers. Injustice happens among in Potiphar's house, injustice has happened, and now he finds himself in jail, in prison. Even when he's now trying his best in prison to make the most of this experience of imprisonment in Egypt, Joseph makes a choice not to complain or to whine about his situation, but instead he bends his will to conform to the prison cell that he's in so that through that experience, he can turn this difficult situation into the most successful prison story that was ever heard. You know, outside of Joseph, 
He could see darkness. He could see um, sadness. He could see despair. He could see hope, hopelessness. That was what was surrounding him on the outside. But many of us realize that inside of Joseph was a gift. And the gift that Joseph had was the gift of interpreting dreams. Imagine someone coming to your office for an interview and you ask him, what's your gift? He says, that's my CV. You'll see, uh, I interpret dreams. You know? He had a weird gift. That's not a gift that you celebrate. That's not a gift that you flaunt. That's not a gift that you're proud of. That's not even a gift that you want to speak about. But he recognized, however small, however insignificant, however uncelebrated the gift that he has, God can use this gift to be able to accomplish his purposes. In his. He didn't look down on the gift because people don't think this gift is worth much. Instead, he fanned his gift to flame and he used his gift while he was in the prison. There are two officers uh, from Pharaoh's palace that were brought to be imprisoned along with him, the cupbearer and the baker. Both of them had dreams. Joseph interprets their dreams success successfully and he tells them, when you leave prison, please remember me. They forgot him. And Joseph is there still using his gift while he is in prison. And for two years, he languishes in jail. But he does not languish in self-pity. He does not languish in anger towards God or this cupbearer that has forgotten him. He had the right to even be suicidal at that point. Nothing in his life was working for him. And he decides to make a decision, not to look at what is happening on the outside, but to continue to focus on what is happening on his inside. He was being sharpened and molded and prepared. And the Bible tells us he rose to the ranks in prison. He was the best performing prisoner. He made a mark in the jail. They probably inscribed his name in one of the corners of the jail. Joseph was here. He was there. He made a positive mark where he was. Everyone else, everyone else had forgotten Joseph. But God remembered him. God remembered him. Pharaoh also had a dream. And in Pharaoh's dream, um, there arose seven cows out of the Nile that were fat and grazed and, and they were sleek and looking nice. And there arose after the seven cows, seven other cows that were ugly, they were finished, they were emaciated. And he was confused. Then the second dream he had was grains of uh, wheat that were healthy and they were vibrant and they were in one stalk. And later on, another seven grains sprouted out that were thin and they were scorched. And he was wondering, what is this? It's a significant message, but I can't. I don't know what it means. He told all the magicians and every bright person in the land to try and interpret it. No one could be found. And while they were looking for people, this cupbearer that is serving Pharaoh remembers that there's a man in prison several years ago who very accurately interpreted my dream. They called for Joseph. Joseph was brought before Pharaoh. He interprets the dream before Pharaoh and tells him Egypt will experience seven years of plenty and then seven years of lack. And God is saying, store up grain in Egypt during the seven years of plenty so that Egypt can not be extinguished, but so that it can survive the seven years of lack. And Pharaoh immediately sees such great wisdom in his words and tells him, you will lead us as a nation through this entire journey. Puts him as prime minister over Egypt, the second most important person in the land. And overnight, we see Joseph's life turning around. You see, what is on your inside matters. What is on your inside matters. What is the gift what is the ability that God has given you that you've allowed people to look down upon or you've allowed yourself to look down upon it? What is that unique, some maybe weird gift that you have, that uncelebrated gift that you have that God would like to use to be able to usher you into your destiny this year? You see, Joseph had 13 messed up years in jail. The darkest moments of his life were in jail. But guess what? His pastime became his passport at the end of the day. This thing that he was doing on the side, this thing that many times we do on the side, not thinking it's of great importance, may be the one thing that God would like to use to be able to take you to the place where he wants to take you. But too many times we consider it the thing we're doing on the side and we never take it seriously. Joseph did. He took it seriously. 
and later on it becomes his passport. The last lesson that we learn from the pencil is what the pencil maker looked at the pencil and told him. And told him, pencil, for you to be of impact in this world, number one, you need to be sharpened. Number two, you need to be held in the right hand. Number three, it's what's on your inside that matters more than what is on your outside. And then he said, number four, you notice that a pencil is different from a pen because it has a rubber. And the reason why it has a rubber is because when you write with a pencil, it's not like a pen because a pencil, you can actually erase what you wrote. And if you want to start all over again, you can write a new chapter afresh. That's the difference with a pencil. It doesn't matter what mistakes you have made as a pencil in writing the story of your life. It doesn't matter how many things you've written and somehow you have to cancel and they're wrong. This pencil maker looked at the pencil and said, don't worry. As a pencil, you're unique because you can rub and you can start all over again. And you can write it out again. And this is the last lesson that we see Joseph teaching us through his life. That you can allow the mistakes you've made or the mistakes that others have made upon you be erased. And you can start and write a new chapter in your life and make a difference and an impact in your life by not allowing yourself to be held back by the mistakes of your past. At the end of Joseph's journey in Egypt, during this famine, Joseph faces his most difficult challenge ever. The same brothers, the same brothers that sold him to Egypt, the same brothers that tried to kill him because the entire land was ravaged by famine and because of the wisdom that God had given Egypt, they were the only part of that territory that had food. So people from lands all around them would come to Egypt to buy food because it was the only place that had food because during the seven years of plenty, they stored up the grain and they had so much grain that they could supply nations around them. These brothers came all the way from the land of Canaan, all the way to Egypt looking for food. And Joseph finds himself in a very weird position. He is the prime minister of Egypt. He is standing and there's a group of people that have come from Canaan that he recognizes, but they don't recognize him. And they are standing below him, desperately standing before Joseph. And they are looking up at Joseph and they are pleading for Joseph to give them food so that their lives can be spared. And I'm sure Joseph was looking down at his brothers at that particular time and remembering the day he was in the pit, in the well, when he was looking up to his brothers, pleading with them to spare his life. The very thing that had happened in the beginning of his life journey is happening now, but now he's no longer that helpless boy in a well. He's now the man that is in charge and is in charge of the most powerful part of that land, the land of Egypt. And he looks down on his brothers and he had the opportunity to pay back for what they had done for him. He had the opportunity to revenge. He had the opportunity to get even. But in God's wisdom, Joseph knew that if you get trapped in the vengeance cycle, if you engage yourself in trying to give revenge for those that have wronged you, the very person you're seeking to repay becomes you. You become the very person that you're seeking to repay when you get sucked into the vengeance cycle. And Joseph makes a value decision right there and says, I do not want to become this. Because many times your past can become your compass and your closet at the same time. It can become the thing that guides you and the thing that locks you up at the same time. Not enabling you to move forward in your life because you've allowed vengeance and the desire to take revenge to hold on to your life. Beyond these brothers that rejected him, that are now before him, Joseph had in mind Potiphar, who God had placed in his life to sharpen him, and Pharaoh, who God had placed in his life to open an opportunity for him to walk into his destiny. 
and in the context of the purposes of God in sharpening me and the purposes of God in opening doors for me, he put rejection in context and said, this is nothing. What God has for me here is greater. And if I settle for this, I will compromise this at the end of the day. And Joseph decides to take the higher road. Joseph releases his past. Joseph takes a step beyond releasing his past. He reunites his family. And Joseph invites his family to settle in Egypt. He gives them a piece of property in Egypt called Goshen, where the children of Israel do not just settle temporarily, but they settled and they lived there for over 400 years. Joseph returns hate and vengeance with purpose, allows himself to step into purpose because he allowed the higher purposes of God and the higher opportunities and plans of God in his life not to compromise the destiny that God had in store for him. I don't know if you've been discouraged or you've been placed in a place of despair because someone you trusted failed you. Joseph had a lineage of these people. He had his brothers, he had Potiphar and Potiphar's house, he had the cupbearer, he had people in his lineage, many people that he had trusted that failed him. Joseph had a lot to erase. He had a lot that could have compromised his destiny that he made a conscious choice to let go. He had bitterness towards his family because his family had betrayed him. He had despair over God's promises for his life as God revealed it when he was 17 years old that he would rule over many, many kingdoms. He had a sense of betrayal from the cupbearer. He, filled, he felt like he was deceived by Potiphar's house and they, they, they engaged deception to place him in the prison. Joseph had a lot that he wanted to erase in his life. As much as Joseph was in touch with the physical reality of his hurt. Joseph was also in touch with the spiritual reality that God uses my hurts. God uses my discouragements. God uses my difficulties. God uses my challenges so that at the end of the day, his purposes can prevail. That is the spiritual reality. That these things are not there by accident. These things are not there to pull me down. These things are there to shape me and to mold me so that God can work his purposes in my life through them. And Joseph's life is summarized in this one verse that he says at the end of his story in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. He said, what the enemy meant for evil, the Lord will use it for your good. And that's the spectacle and the message and the hallmark of his life is that he allowed his life to learn the principle of the eraser, that I can actually let go of the mistakes that I have made and that others have made in my life, and that I and God, because God is holding my hand, because God is in charge of my life, I and God can write out a new chapter. And we see Joseph writing out a new chapter for the children of Israel and not getting sucked in to the mistakes that many people around him had actually made. Let me just close with three questions, four questions to us. Four questions to us. If you're in the place of sharpening right now, you're in the place of great adversity right now, you're in the place of great challenge, discouragement, and despair right now, I'm going to ask you this very difficult question. Are you running away from Egypt? It doesn't matter who has betrayed you. It doesn't matter who has sold you off to whatever. It doesn't matter who has thrown you in whatever deep the pit is. And you've been picked up and you're on your way to Egypt. Have you abandoned that difficult journey of being sharpened by God through trial and difficulty? And are you running away from Egypt? And yet God's purposes for you are in the direction that he has allowed you to go, however difficult that direction is. Are you running away from your marriage? Are you running away from your education? Are you running away from your business? Are you running away from your faith? Are you running away from your e-group? Are you running away from your children? Are you running away from God's destiny for you? 
however difficult, however trying it is, are you running away from Egypt? This morning, God is reminding us to accept the principle of sharpening and recognize that God is at work in your life to make you better at the end of the day if you allow him to hold your hand. The second question I want to ask us is around the surrender to God to hold your hand even at this time. Who is holding your life right now? For some of us, it's my job that is holding my life. And the minute I lose my job, my life will stop. For some of us, it's my spouse that is holding my life right now. And the minute they are not there, my life will stop. For some of us, it's my business. For some of us, it could be my education. For some of us, it's my knowledge. For some of us, it's my talent. It's my skills. It's my abilities. What is it that you have entrusted your life to? And you're setting yourself up for the greatest disappointment because that thing cannot hold your life. You need to place your life in the right hand so that at the end of the day, it amounts to what God has purposed and planned for you. The third question I ask is about the insight. What is it that is inside you that you have ignored? And you have made what is around you your focus. You have made what surrounds you the object of your life. And yet God wants to use that gift, that talent, that ability, that passion, that thing that he has placed inside you as a tool to mold you towards your destiny. And you have withdrawn it from God and have not given it completely to him. What is it that is on your inside that God has reminded you about today that you need to ask God to use it and to maximize it? Because therein lies your destiny. And the last is about erasing. What is it that God is asking you to let go of, to release, so that he can erase? The pencil cannot erase itself. It is the holder of the pencil who sent his son, Jesus Christ, on earth to die on the cross, to shed his blood, the only thing that can forgive my sin, the only thing that can give me a clean slate in my life is nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ alone. And it's only when that blood washes, blots away my sin. Isaiah 55 says, even though your sin was as red as scarlet, in fact, it uses two versions of red. Red as scarlet, red as crimson. Deep red or bright red. Even though your sin was as conspicuous as possible, everybody knows it's bright red. Even though it is as deep as possible, it, you've gotten into the sin so deep you can't get yourself out. The Bible tries to use this image to tell us even though your sin was as deep as crimson, as red as scarlet, God will make it as white as snow. You can start a new chapter with God if you allow God to erase the mistakes of your past, to erase the shortcomings of your life, and as the pencil, allow yourself to write the story of your life again. Can we bow our heads as we pray and commit ourselves to God's word? In the quietness um, of this moment. I recognize in the beginning of the year, it's such a significant time for us as we focus on the year ahead of us. Let me start by praying for someone here who wants to surrender their life to Jesus Christ. You've made mistakes. You have shortcomings. And you've allowed those mistakes and shortcomings make you think that you cannot start anew and afresh with God. But today, like Joseph and his relationship with his brothers, God is reminding you the prince of Egypt was Joseph, but the king of kings and the lord of lords, the prince of heaven, is reminding you today that he wants to forgive you everything. He wants to forgive you everything that you have done and give you the opportunity to restore your relationship with him and to start afresh. And if that's you and you need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ today, and you feel in your heart you're convicted to surrender your life to him so that God could deal with your past, and give you a new chapter in your life, I kindly request that you put up your hand, wherever you are. You're saying, my sin is too deep. But God is saying, there's no sin too deep that he cannot wash. 
You're saying my sin is too bright. Everybody knows. And God is reminding you there is no sin that is too bright that I cannot forgive. So if you're there, just put up your hand. You're saying, I want to surrender my life to Christ. I need forgiveness from Jesus Christ. I need Jesus to wash away my sin. Um, just lift up your hand. I can see you. Uh, the middle. Anyone else? Thank you at the back. I can see you at the very back. Just keep your hand up if that's you. In the middle, I can see you. Thank you. Anyone else? You're saying, this is me. Thank you. I can see you on my left. God bless you. On my very extreme left, I can see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, right in front. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. If your hand is up, I just want you to make this simple prayer in your heart. It's just a prayer of surrender. And you're saying, all those that have their hands up, you're saying, I want to surrender my life to Christ, and I want Christ to wash away my sin. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I invite you into my heart to be my Savior and my Lord. Wash my sins away by the blood of Jesus and give me a new life today. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to pray. I just want to pray for uh, one more group of people. And that's anyone who any of these four points um, from Joseph's life has made sense to you because that's the situation that you're in. If you're in a season of sharpening and you have literally, literally been walking away from Egypt and God is telling you this difficult and trying situation that is before you is part of his purposes and God wants you to stick in it because he's saying, I will carry you through. And you just want to surrender that season to God and tell him, I commit to walk with God uh, through this season. I'm walking back into my marriage. I'm walking back into whatever situation that God has reminded you about. Um, I kindly request um, that we take some time to respond to God. Or if you're here and you're um, saying that, no, for me, it's surrendering to God. Um, God is not holding me up. There are many things that I've put my trust in more than God. Or you're saying there's something I've neglected on my inside and I've been focusing on my outside. Or at the end of the day, you're saying, um, I just need some issues in my life to be dealt with by God. Please lift up your hand if you're saying that's you. Whatever situation or circumstance it is, I just want to give you an opportunity to surrender that circumstance to God. Um, those that are lifting up their hands, I want to, to give you an opportunity to make a commitment to God. Make a commitment to God right now and tell God this is the situation. This is the issue. This is the circumstance. This is the way you have spoken to me. And I know I want to make this commitment here so that I can walk this journey with you this year. Uh, Father, you see the commitments that are being made before you. I thank you for the hearts that are making it, the lives that are making those commitments. I thank you for your word and how your word is relevant to us and speaks to us in the situations that we're in. Father, we mentioned how so often in Genesis you mentioned that you are with Joseph. My prayer is that you will be with us and walk with us this journey of these four areas that you prompted us about so that we truly experience victory in God as Joseph experienced victory. Father, as we continue in this series, I pray for testimonies of people that made commitments to you and are seeing aspects of their life come back to life because Jesus has breathed a fresh breath into them. I pray for people that will be strengthened in places they are weak and they had given up, that you'd give us a new resolve. I pray for wisdom, Lord, that you speak wisdom into our minds to make the right decisions. I pray for grace and the ability to let go and to forgive in areas that you want us to let go and forgive. I pray for healing, a healing that only comes from our Savior, Jehovah Rapha, the one that heals us. May we experience that healing in every aspect of our lives. So, Father, as we begin this year, we dedicate ourselves to be like Joseph. We dedicate ourselves, oh God, to walk into the different purposes that you have in store for us and to allow you to shape and mold us in the way that you want us to become. So, Father, we thank you as we release these commitments into your hands and pray that truly your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't we rise uh, to our feet as we close with the words um, of the grace. Um, I'm going to kindly request if... If you gave your life to Jesus Christ, right in front, our pastors are here. If you could come and just fill in a card like this, because we have a team that helps people in their journey of their faith and would like to connect you with this team this week. Uh, so if you could come in front and just pick up a card like this, right in front we'll be here and fill it in. It will just take a minute before you leave. Can we celebrate all those that gave their lives to Jesus Christ today? Uh, we thank God for you and we celebrate you. So please come forward and fill this in.
Again, please turn to your neighbors. We share with them the words of the grace. Please remind them you're a transformer, okay? Please remind them. CKPLC, you're a transformer, okay, Sasa? Please remind them. Uh, and tell them, Ntaku Mulika, okay? Mulika transformer, okay? Sasa. Please share with them the words of the grace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and may the love of God and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week.